Okay, uh, today I want to talk about the, um, your family systems analysis, but before I do that, I just kind of want to review a little bit on Beaver's model, um, because when I first presented it, there were, um, there's a little bit of a, there's a difference between what Beaver's talks about as the seven dimensions of family competence, and then when he talks about the five types of families, he uses different terms. So I want to kind of try to find some way to connect those two for you. Uh, and so the first thing I want to do is uh, look at how these terms connect and just review quickly what he's talking about in each dimension. And then we'll go through um, each of the five types, or we'll go through each dimension and see how we judge the family in the movie Crooklyn. Uh, and that was your family systems analysis. So um, in Beaver's structural model, he talks about control when he talks about the five types, he has a heading control. And that's the same as his dimension of power and control. Okay, so that's a pretty clear one, pretty straightforward. Um, is this going to work? Looks like it needs battery. Hello, Monday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, and when he talks about power and control or control, he's talking about whether there's clear lines of authority, especially across generations. So remember Beaver's idea is that there should be hierarchy, that adults should have more power than children, and that the adults coordinate their activities and don't form coalitions with the children against the other adult. <coughs> and so clear parental coalition is a sign of this clear lines of authority. You would expect a family that was high on, that was good on control, that was optimal on control would be, um, everybody would know their place pretty clearly, and so there wouldn't be a lot of conflicts about privilege and rights and responsibilities. Um, within generations, it's equality, okay, just as a, as a review. The second dimension that he ties into his types is role organization, and that's the same idea as contextual clarity. Remember that? Okay. So contextual clarity or role organization. And some of the key elements here is, are the roles that people have, the expectations that they have, are they appropriate given the person's abilities and skills uh, and other demands on their time? Are they effective? So is there a level of complementarity in, in the role allocation? Is it, is it one person doing everything or are things sort of spread out such that no one person is overloaded uh, in terms of role responsibilities? Also here is the clarity of those expectations and the individual's acceptance of what their part is. Okay, so if I'm the one responsible for doing the dishes, then I, I, I'm okay with that. That's what I do and I do the dishes, or take out the trash, whatever, right? The third is boundaries, and it's the same in both. Uh, with regard to external boundaries, whether they're externally open and regulated. So Beaver thinks that the boundaries of the family, the external boundaries, should be open, but very regulated. So there's no passage of information, energy, or matter across those boundaries without some monitoring of what's, what's coming and going and some restrictions when necessary, but not so much restrictions that you would say it's a closed boundary, that there's, there's an openness to the environment. Uh, internally, that boundaries would be balanced, that there's a level of openness so that people can communicate with each other, they kind of know what others' lives are like, but there's also a closed closeness around subsystems and a closeness around individuals, such that individuals have some privacy, some private space. Now that internal boundary is a little bit tricky because it gets tied into um, the dimensions of affective um, responsiveness and uh, involvement. The fourth type was uh, problem solving, this fourth dimension problem solving. He calls it problem solving when he talks about the five types. He calls it conflict management when he talks about it more generally. So how does the family solve its problems? How does it manage conflicts that arise in the day-to-day -day interactions? And an optimal family has non-destructive conflict management. P 
People don't put each other down. They don't try to win at the other person's cost. They don't uh, use physical or verbal or emotional abuse against one another to get their ways. Um, and so that would be non-destructive conflict management. This usually entails direct and open negotiation between the parties. They, each one knows what each other wants and they talk about why they want what they're, what they're seeking and, and how they can get something together uh, where both can uh, actually realize at least some of what they uh, desire in the situation. So direct and open negotiation and rational and effective uh, approaches to problems. The people sit down, they talk about the options, they talk about the pros and cons, about the different options, and then they make a decision that maximizes uh, the outcomes for all. Communication is, as best I can connect it, when Beaver talks about connect communication in his five types, he's really getting at what he otherwise called affective involvement. And so, but here in his models, he's really specifying the nature of the ways in which people are involved in, with, in, in each other's lives, how they interact. Uh, so warm, the use of warm and optimistic tones when people talk to each other. Uh, affiliative orientation, uh, people sh demonstrate that they really like each other, that they want to do things with each other. Um, and uh, they don't want to, uh, they don't want to um, uh, alienate each other. And empathy and intimacy. So there's a lot of sort of understanding what each other is going through. There's a lot of uh, deep disclosure of, of personal needs and wants. So the one on the left, like the problem solving, is just like the general concept and then like an optimal family has conflict management that follow? Well, no, actually, so this, on this side, the problem solving is, if you remember correctly, uh, in when I talked about the five types that he has, and then for each type, he, so optimal, um, adequate, yeah, mid -range, right? Mid-range, borderline, severely. And special. so when he talks about those, he, there's seven dimensions, and he classifies as how these families would uh -huh. fit uh -huh. on each of those seven dimensions, right? So those seven dimensions that he's using there are on this side. Okay. Right? Uh -huh. Over here is, before we even talked about the five types, I talked about his model as having seven dimensions. Oh, okay and he doesn't use the exact same terms. And so we have to try to fit them together. And that's what I'm trying to get across here and also kind of quickly review what were the optimals. Okay. So this is how optimals would fit. These are, that's why I have an equal sign. Communication okay, is the same thing as affective involvement. Okay, so when he's talking about like, let's say problem solving in here, he's talking about their conflict management. Yeah, he's talking okay. about how they can manage conflicts. Okay, perfect. Or what he, previously termed conflict management. Yeah. So if you go and read about how he talks about conflict management in the early parts of his article, you get, oh, he's talking about not just how they manage differences of opinion, but he's also talking about how they go about solving problems as a family. So they're kind, kind of combined into this idea of conflict management, but when he talks about it in the five types, he talks about it as problem solving. So I'm sorry, but that's, no, that's okay. how he, he, there's that ambiguity, there's that sort of confusion in, in his own presentation uh, of these dimensions. Um, and then affective responsiveness is the same as what he would talk earlier about when he says a family should have high levels of respect for autonomy. And so affective responsiveness isn't so much how much individuals feel willing to express themselves and how they, how they express themselves in terms of warmth, etc. But it's more about when people have needs that are expressed, or even if they're not expressed, if they're, if they're not directly expressed, if even if they're indirectly expressed through their behaviors, what happens in response? How does the family respond? Uh, and so here he has tolerance of ambiguity. Are people willing to accept that not everybody's going to be interpretable <laughs> at, at, a given, at any given moment, that there will be uh, that individuals are going through things and we might not understand them completely, but we accept them anyway. Uh, we don't demand that they be a certain way. We let them sort of find their own way of going. 
Uh, and so that giving that individual that freedom to be autonomous is part of this. Um, responsiveness to affective expressions, how do you respond? And here it's more, you know, when people s express some issue or need that they have, be it, again, be it indirectly or directly, that's the communication side of it, what is the response? Do, do they get a response? Do people say, oh, tell me more, invest some time in helping them work through what it, they need to be worked through, needs to be worked through, through or do they just sort of ignore it? Okay. Uh, are they aware? And then f free expression of feelings and needs so people feel like they're going to be able to uh, express their needs because they know that the kind of response they're going to get is, a, is an, a, an affirming one. Okay. And then finally, transcendent values, and that's really just the beliefs about the place of the family in the wider universe. Um, again, oftentimes they're religious, other times they could be um, secular. The key here is that there is a strong notion of who we are as a family and how we, what is important to us, what is our place, in the larger universe uh, of which we're a part, that we have a mission as a family um, that's beyond just us. And how clear is that idea ex um, accepted by everybody in the family, and how much does it orient the family in its day-to-day -day life? Okay. All right, so let's uh, go through each of these and um, talk about the movie a little bit, but before we talk about the movie in each of these areas, I'm going to just put up uh, a summary of the, f the five types. Originally we looked at the five, we looked at the seven dimensions within each five types. Now I'm going to look at each dimension and look at the five types, how they score in that dimension. So if you remember control, um, if we looked at the five types, optimal, adequate, mid-range, borderline, severely dysfunctional. And optimal, we said, was egalitarian within generations and hierarchical across generations with a clear parental coalition. Adequate was um, constant control efforts. Adequate was they worked at control. It was important. It wasn't something that they were necessarily preoccupied with, but they, there were lots of failures in their ability to control. and so. There's, they're constantly trying to recreate some order in the family, um, probably because they're giving a lot of autonomy, and that autonomy is creating chaos to some degree, and so they're constantly trying to correct and correct and correct. Um, and a weaker parental coalition, all right? Um, that would be adequate. Mid-range is, these are preoccupied with control. And so in the mid-range, there's a suppression, there's more of a suppression of autonomy that we need to keep things in order, and so we can't allow people to go and express themselves uh, very much. And then, um, and so there's not a lot of tolerance of individuality and autonomy in the preoccupied with control in the mid-range group. The borderline is tyrannical. So this is a little bit beyond just trying to keep order. It's where one member, or possibly two, are trying to direct for their own needs and not, it's not a matter of trying to keep the family in order, it's a matter of making the family work for them. Okay. And then severely dysfunctional is no control, it's chaos, it's anarchy. Okay? So, what kinds of examples did you get that reflect control? Um, well, one that was really persistent in the movie was like the mother's like trying control of like the children's television watching, okay. the idiot box as she called it. Mm -hmm. um, it was always, she would like ask them to turn it off and then just yell at them to turn it off, not like go up there and actually turn it off and make them do something else. It was kind of a constant effort to try and get it to turn it off, but they never ended up turning it off. Like they just would turn the volume down or... Right. And then going along with that with their weak parental coalition, one of the examples is the Knicks. Um, and the mother tells them to turn the TV off and the dad's like, no, let them watch the game. And so they weren't really on the same page of how the TV should be okay. handled on school nights. Okay, so the, that TV watching episodes, uh, one is they're watching TV and the parents can't, they have rules, mm -hmm. but they, the rules are, 
they're not, you wouldn't say they were pre, would you say they were preoccupied with control in that example, or you would say they were constantly trying constantly to, constantly, co constant efforts, right? It, like they always had to be corrected. The kids were always trying to find some other avenue, and uh, they were watchful to a certain degree, and when they saw it get out of control, they then tried to bring the control back in to line. And weak parental coalition in the sense that the parents should have had a united front about the television watching. Yeah, that those rules should have been created in a way. Yeah, I was going to say, that's when the fight, like that, the big, you That's know, when the big blow the up whole, happens, yeah, right? Yeah, because, you know, she was saying one thing and then he just kind of tried to buffer, you know, and just be like, no, just, you know, and mm -hmm. it's almost like good cop, bad cop, and so uh -huh. they just like... But in good cop, bad cop, the, both the cops have a common objective, but in yeah, this but case, it, it, it didn't, yeah. right? He just didn't want to deal with it almost, right. so... Yeah, Good. and then I think one of the reasons, like, later on, like, in that scene, I think one of the reasons why he did that is because he was like, I just want some respect in my house, and, like, so I think mm -hmm. it was kind of like he was undermining her because she wasn't giving him respect, and he wanted to be heard, and so okay. that... Okay, so the, a, sort of a lack of equality that he was feeling, like, mm -hmm. he's trying to assert his position? Like, he wanted some sort of input on something. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Because prior to that, she was talking about how um, he bounced another check, and you know mm -hmm. she does all the housework and everything, and you know mm -hmm. she has to work, and he needs to do this, so he like, didn't really have. Any yeah, input the, the, for they're him. struggling within the generation about what is the balance of this of power, mm -hmm. and and he's trying to assess, he's trying to argue for his uh, rights yeah, based she, upon his previous breadwinning. And she's arguing that, no, he doesn't have those rights anymore because she's the one that's doing the breadwinning now, right? Yeah, because he made a comment about, I can't remember what the place was, but it must have yeah, must up -y -y up because he was just like, I would let you go in there and buy whatever you yeah, wanted. Yeah. And so he made that comment a couple right. times. But, and she, oh, go. Okay, did we see this also, any other examples of where we see a weak parental coalition? Um, or where you see some strength of the parental coalition? I was going to say the dinner table when they're eating, like, their mm -hmm. food, like, she, so, the time where one of their sons, like, she was making him eat the black eyed peas yeah. or whatever, mm -hmm. and then he was, like, passing out, like, the tree bread, bread and stuff, <laughs> yeah. and, like, I don't she I was, see. like, trying to make him eat his food, and he was just, like, really, like, he wasn't helping her out on it, right. you know, right. like, he was actually, like, almost, like, like, poking her, like, oh, look, everyone has this stuff, and, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that was a good good example. They weren't on the same page about him eating the peas. Yeah. yeah. Another one was at the dinner table when one of the kids was chewing with his mouth open and the mom's like, uh -huh. shut your mouth. And the dad just lets out a giant burp. And it's like... Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Oh, that was a great example, right. Helpful. It's like, this was not helpful for <laughs> yeah, you to do that. Yeah, not at all. Right. Um, mm -hmm. When we were on... I'm trying to think of one when we were on the same page. Um... There was, oh, I felt like they came, this is like what I saw is whenever they would, th their son would like throw trash into the oh, their yeah. neighbor's like, you know, mm -hmm. area or whatever. Yard. Yeah. <laughs> they, both parents, like no matter, like their son did it, you know, and like they were going back and forth, but both parents were always there to like. Okay. Let's come back to that when we okay. talk about boundaries. Okay. Because <laughs> I think that's a good example of boundaries. Okay. Uh, what about when some of the parental coalition is not seen all that directly. It's kind of indirectly inferred from what happens. So they decide to send the children away, oh, yeah. right, for the summer, two yeah, of the kids, sure, yeah. right? And so it's, it's, they were, they seem to be on the same page about doing that. Mm -hmm. So they must have discussed it in private, apart from the children, and then presented it to them, it seemed. And then what about when they're driving in the car? And the two of them are talking. It's late at night. Oh yeah, and then he says, "Oh great, you woke up Troy." Oh great, you woke up yeah. Troy. I felt I was like, "Whoa!" Oh, but that's so aggressive. but in a way, when Troy came into the front seat, they stopped talking about what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had that boundary. Like and uh -huh. like with the first argument, they didn't get in a fight in front of the kids as well. It was downstairs. Away it was from downstairs. The kids. Yeah. So actually, that's maybe better a better example of boundaries, internal boundaries, than it is parental coalition. Um, but. Uh, this would be seem to be a weakness 
in this family weak parent. So where would we put them? We'd put them adequate on control. I put them like between adequate and mid range uh -huh. because okay. I felt like even though they they were very the mother was preoccupied with control. Like it wasn't like it didn't consume her, but she was very like this is what we do here, this mm -hmm. is what we do here, you're going to do this because I say so, blah, blah, you need to stop watching TV, what are you doing? You I, feel, yeah, I feel like she, yeah, I mean, I feel like she had to be that way, though. Yeah, oh, I think so, too. Yeah, like, she wasn't the dad getting, have done it. you know, the extra, not help, but, like, reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, she was trying to, like, make these kids, like, function, you know, like, be okay, and she didn't have her other half, like, helping her. Okay. That. What I would say is that in preoccupied with control, you wouldn't find much freedom and autonomy oh, in okay. those families. Okay, so she's you wouldn't like, you wouldn't find the kids being allowed to go out and yeah, sort of do whatever, hang out yeah. on the streets okay. together, you know, do or or where they would be playing without direct supervision. Uh, you wouldn't see them having their own space where they were negotiating about the TV and all of that. That that would have been. So that's more like not there, right? Someone just having a power trip and just wanting to like be. Well, know, well, not a power trip. You know, borderline would be the power trip. Okay. This is just like she has to constantly. This would just be. It. We're <laughs> constantly. We're going to prevent people from creating any noise in the system. You know, that's a good systems term, by the way, is noise. Right? Noise is is disruption of order. And so the noise comes from individual inputs that are allowed to come in to the day-to-day -day life of the family. And, and in this family, that's allowed a lot. There's a lot of options for people to tell what they're feeling. And so we'll tie this in later when we talk about affective involvement and, and responsiveness. But you know, in a preoccupied with control, you, wouldn't, you would create cert circumstances where the disruption wouldn't happen. Not that you're on a power trip, but you're just trying to keep order, and the way you're going to keep order is by making sure that everything is supervised, that when children are in the home, they're watched, when they're outside the home, their activities are largely controlled to keep from things happening that go wrong. They're not given a lot of autonomy to the individuals, and so that would be more preoccupied with control. So I, th I think the, the where did, where did you put them on? I put them in adequate. In adequate, yeah. And you were adequate or somewhere in between, mm -hmm. right. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to give, again, it's hard to come up with a definitive answer to these. The bigger question is how you get there to that answer. And then what it tells us about the meaning of these, of the differences here. So this is the family, this adequate is a family that's giving the members a lot of autonomy. And that's usually good because one of the, that's one of the balancing acts, right, in Olson's model between autonomy and connectedness. The, the individuals have to have autonomy, but when individuals have autonomy and independence and freedom within the co family system, then that's likely to create disruption and it has the potential to cause disruption. And so that means you wind up having to engage in lots of uh, control efforts. Um, in the optimal, you don't have the disruption because the individuals are given autonomy, but they also have very clear ideas of what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what's, what can be done and what can't be done. They follow the rules, because, not because they're, the rules are enforced from above, but usually because the children are taught why those rules are there and what's appropriate behavior or not. So children are basically engaging in internal controls of their own behavior, so that means it's not necessary for parents to overtly control what they're doing. Uh, and so that's you know, that, that's not what's happening in this family. This is more in this area of uh, adequate. Okay. Um, next is uh, role organization um, and the five types. So optimal would be clear and complementary roles based on ability and individual fit uh, and, a, and a balance that the, the role responsibilities are kind of spread out. Adequate would be some sex and age stereotyping. Uh, Mid-range would be strong sex and age stereotyping. Borderline stereotyped and very rigid. And severely dysfunctional would be chaotic and stereotyped, uh, if to the extent that there's any exists. So, um, you know, what, how would we, what would be some examples uh, that illustrate role organization in, in the movie, in, in the Crooklyn um, movie? 
Um, well, just like a little piece that I saw for the age stereotyping uh -huh. is when they were, when um, the mom came home from work and she like woke everyone up and told mm -hmm. them to go downstairs and like clean and stuff. She said to the oldest child, like, you're the oldest and this mm -hmm. is what example are you setting for your younger, you know, right. siblings? Like, I mean, it's not said, oh, you need to behave this way or do this to show them you're just expected. Mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. that's, that's what I put for what I saw about age. Okay. Because I didn't really see any difference between like Troy and the rest of like the... Okay. Maybe I don't. I didn't in that scene, but I know that Troy was the only one that went to go grocery shopping, like kind of like a womanly kind of thing to go grocery shopping and help really? to cook. And then one of the boys was asked to take out the garbage when the whole yeah. scene with the thing. Yep. Yep. So that's kind of, I mean, there was some sex stereotyping. And then like when Troy came back from her aunt's house and was like, I can help you cook, I can help you clean, and mm -hmm. I don't need help from anyone. Like she was willing to take on the women stereotype roles of the household mm -hmm. and take those over because her mother was sick. Yeah, and then when her yeah, mother good. did pass away, like you do see her mm -hmm. like doing all this stuff and then c picking out her brother's hair and whatnot. So... So some sex role stereotyping, yeah, she takes care of, and she takes care of the youngest boy. Mm -hmm. Is it Joseph? Is that the I think that's the name. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joseph was free from responsibilities because he was the youngest. And so there was that kind of, so age, we see some age in sex role stereotyping in this family. Um, do we get a sense that the roles were, a, I mean, it's a little bit hard because these children are pretty young. Mm -hmm. um, we see some element of, I'm not sure if it's age stereotyping as much as it is just a recognition of abilities. Um, so Troy goes to the grocery store. Um, maybe that's an example of some sex role stereotyping. She's going to be responsible for shopping for groceries, which would be a woman's job. On the other hand, she seems pretty young for going to the store. Yeah. And, but, um, Carolyn is making some judgment there, perhaps, that she's capable of doing it. Um, maybe it's a miss, maybe it's a bad example because, you know, maybe it's not the best fit for her. Maybe she is too young and we see her wind up getting beat up and shoplifting and such. Yeah. So maybe she's been giving too much responsibility relative to who she is. Mm -hmm. Now, why would that happen? We have to then go beyond the stereotyping element and ask, well, is the role allocation fair and balanced in this family? Who's doing the work? Oh, as far as like Carolyn doing everything? Isn't Carolyn doing everything, yeah, right? she literally does everything. And in some ways it's, it's, it's out of balance yeah. that there isn't a sharing of role responsibilities that this family has decided, they either decided uh, when Witty decided, when they decided that Witty was not going to be the <laughs> breadwinner anymore, that he was going to have time for his music, which it seems like they agreed upon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, previously to a certain extent. Yeah, but there was no adjustment in what his responsibilities were around the house, so he wasn't doing anything except writing his music, and Carolyn was doing everything. Yeah. What was he doing during the day? Like, you know, when the kids... Writing his music. Oh, so... Oh, okay. He was in the basement, uh, we assume. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Like... We don't, we don't see him. He's not part of everyday life. Yeah, yeah he that's why I was kind of like... Yeah. And now, so before he quit, it may have been more balanced because he was a major breadwinner. And so, although we get the sense that probably she was still doing all the housework and, and working as well, but maybe she wasn't was working as much. So we don't see... We see a lot of problems. It's not optimal. It's not... First of all, people don't know what they're supposed to do, right? Uh, especially the children. And there's not a balance here. There's not, no complementarity. It's overloaded on one side. And so she experiences a lot of what we call role overload. She has too many responsibilities. And that leads into all kinds of other problems in the family, right? Um, and to the extent that there is any allocation of roles, it's minimal, it's based more on sex and age than it is on individual fit. Um, and so it would seem like they would probably fall somewhere in, I, I don't think I'd put them in mid-range. Why? You don't, 
I don't see the strong like sex and age stereotyping. You don't. Like, well, would you say the example of where there was no sex and age stereotyping? That this family was able to organize themselves outside of what would have traditionally been the roles of men and women in society. No? Mm -hmm. Like, because you see, like, the things in the movie, like the mom cooking and cleaning and taking care of the kid's hair and making sure everything's clean, making sure dinner's ready, making sure all the stuff is done. And you don't really see, I mean, it's going off the parents, you don't really see the dad doing anything in the house. Like, he couldn't even, like, tell Carolyn that he paid the electric bill and that the check bounced and that wasn't even taken care of. Mm -hmm. So she financially is managing things. Is managing everything in the family even though mm -hmm. maybe where it's not based on sex is like that she's the breadwinner. Yeah. That she right. that would probably be the only thing that would be a deviation from this. Yeah. I mean the fact that she's doing everything isn't a sign of the stereotyping. It's just a sign of an overload. Yeah. Um, in fact, the fact that she's doing everything would say that they're not fully, not strongly sex mm -hmm. and age stereotyped. She's capable of working, uh, and um, there's an acceptance of him not working. And so her being the breadwinner would be a sign that this family, for whatever reason, and, and I think the reason is the value they place on individual fulfillment. And, uh, and expression, and we'll come to that later as some of their value system, but you see that uh, they, at some point before the movie begins, they sat down and decided that he was going to, they were going to make room for him to do his music. And that meant an ability to go beyond sexual stereotyping. For them to say, it's okay for a man not to be the breadwinner for a while. A woman can take over those responsibilities. So I think that's, that shows a certain flexibility that's not, that's not captured by strong sexual stereotyping. Yeah. I don't know if this would go in communication, but it was in the car when they were talking. Mm -hmm. It was like, he's like, you don't support me. And she's like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't know if yeah. that's like... I think that's in communication more. Okay. Yeah. But because it, it doesn't... She's... What she's saying there is, look, we're, we're going beyond what would be traditionally expected. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I've taken on all these things for you, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that's that sign that they're flexible in that regard uh, is a sign that they're not strongly sex and age stereotyped. I think there's some. So would it be like a combination, kind of more adequate but slightly mid-range? Um, I think it would be more adequate than anything. The only reason I would, might put them in the mid-range is because what's not expressed here is the idea that the, there's, a, there's a balance in the role allocation. And that's where they really fall down. So to call them adequate in the role organization, when you consider the idea of whether they're balanced and complementary, you'd have to say, eh, not really. You know, they're pretty low on that regard. So. Because there is that overload. There is one person responsible for way too much stuff. And there's lack of clarity about who's responsible for what in many areas, both with regard to the children and with regard to Woody. Uh, and so, yeah, in that sense, I would maybe push them down on the low adequate end, close to mid-range. But um, I think I'd still put them in the adequate because this is implying, again, remember, control, mid-range control, was um, uh, mid-range control was um, not constant control efforts, but it was uh, preoccupation with control. And so a preoccupation with control would have roles designated for people very clearly. And those roles would be strongly enforced. Those expectations would be strongly enforced. Uh, and so that mid-range would have to fit within that constant of role organization would have to fit within that notion of control. And I don't think that's where they're at. I think they're more ambiguous, a lack of clarity, a lack of things getting done in efficient ways, an overload of one member, 
and that's creating the problem of control in other ways because people don't have a sense of order, they don't have a sense of their part that's very clear. And so that, I would, I think I, I, think I come down on the adequate um, pretty, more strongly than I would mid-range. Okay. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting because when we talk about this, you can see how these ideas of a typology come about. That you have this kind of control and this kind of role organization, they seem to go together. That it's hard to envision a strongly sex and age stereotyping kind of family with a preoccup with a uh, with a constant control effort kind of family that they don't quite fit together. That if everybody knows what they're supposed to do because of their age and their gender, you're not preoccupied with control. So. Uh, I'm sorry, you are preoccupied with control. That's how control is being managed. Um, when people aren't sure, then things aren't getting done, and so you're constantly trying to bring order back into the family, and so that would be more the adequate. Other examples of rural organization, okay, the bill paying. So things weren't getting done. The bills weren't being paid appropriately, right? And of course, the children didn't do their part of cleaning. We saw that scene in the evening, right? It was like four in the morning when she woke up. <laughs> uh, boundaries um, optimal are externally open and regulated, adequate, externally open and regulated also, mid range, more closed. Again, preoccupied with control. You close off the boundaries, you don't allow variation into the system from outside. Um, borderline is more fluctuating boundaries, sometimes they're open, sometimes they're closed uh, to severe extents, and then severely dysfunctional is unregulated boundaries. So the external boundaries of this family are how would you characterize them, I and what are some examples of external boundary maintenance? Um, well, I would say they're externally open and, you know, somewhat regulated. I mean, they let their children run free, pretty much. Okay. You know, about, like, I feel like a main part of the movie was them on the stoop, just, you know, running back and forth, playing their games okay. or doing whatever. So there's a lot of freedom for the kids out on the streets. We see yeah. them playing out in the street. We see them on the stoop. We see them, we see them exposed to things outside the environment. Yeah, like, Troy goes to the store and, like, by herself mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. She sees... Whatever was going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she's just kind of like Connie. You know? uh -huh, yeah. Connie. Right. And then they see I can't remember his name, but the guy getting the cop car. Yeah, the guy getting uh, arrested. What's his name? Tony? Vin Tony? No, no, Vinny. Something they call him like the main Vince. man or something yeah. like yeah. that. Vince, I think Vin his name is. Yeah, but he, like she sees that, she's exposed to that and it's mm -hmm. you know So there's a lot of the kids are out uh, and they're they're getting influenced by their environment and coming back into the home. So that would be kind of open. Yeah. Now, regulated? Uh, you know, the fact that she's going out there and it doesn't get processed would indicate that it's not regulated. Yeah. Or that there's a... It get processed. Well, there's, the parents aren't aware of those experiences that Troy is having. Because she doesn't go and say, oh, look, this is what happened. She goes upstairs and she talks to her brother and she's like, yeah, I know he got arrested. <laughs> like, uh -huh. So she doesn't like say it to her parents. She doesn't talk to her parents about it. Yeah. And her parents aren't asking her about her day or what happened, right? So mm -hmm. there's, some, there's some failure of regulation there. But in other ways, it is regulated. Where are they playing? How far away do they venture? Do they go much beyond their block? Mm -hmm. Right? So there's a sense of there's a rule that how far you can go. Um, what about the stoop? What's happening there? The stoop is like the boundary threshold of the family in some ways, right? Yeah. And, and are they aware what's going on on the stoop? Are, is the, are the parents aware of what's going on right out in the immediate neighborhood? No? I feel like, well, I feel like the mom, Carolyn says something about to Troy once. She says, like, oh, your 
brothers are playing that stupid game out there or something like that. Uh-huh. So, I mean, she kind of knows what goes on. Okay. Um, but I think that there's also times when, like, Troy's, like, fighting with the girl about their hairstyle, and the mom yeah. has no idea that she's going to make fun of for the hairstyle, or that um, those kids are, like, huffing something out yeah. of a paper bag <laughs> and, and chasing the kids around. It, they weren't really aware of that kind of stuff that was going on, and the kids okay. never right. really told the parents that okay. that was going on either. All right, so we're coming down on the side of not so e well regulated. How about the scene where Caroline sitting on the stoop, uh, sitting in, in the, the basement with the window her. open? Yeah, She's she watching what's going on. Yeah. And the boy comes and tells her what Troy did, right? And then she corrects Troy because, so she, she's probably overloaded, which is detracting, because of the role organization, is detracting from the ability to regulate what's going on. And so, it's externally open and regulated, but not as regulated as it should be, optimally. It's certainly not closed. They're not prevented from going out. Mm -hmm. The only thing you might say is they might, it might be fluctuating. Sometimes it's regulated, sometimes it's not, but I don't, I don't ever see it being closed. So I think we're probably going to go, well, it might be here a little bit, uh, but it's not completely unregulated. It's just a lower level of regulation. They're, they're not monitoring as effectively as they could. And the reason is, is because there's a lack of per parents available time. Like Woody's involved in his music and Caroline's doing everything else. So how much time does she have to sit there and watch what's happening? She doesn't ask a lot. She we don't see her talking to the kids like, so what happened today? she ever asked about anything was when she asked Troy if she took the coins. Okay. That's it's the only thing she really Right. Asked. And she did she ask her about what happened with the grocery store too? Oh yeah. yeah. And then she said <laughs> I, I would have beat her up. Get something. beat up by Peanut. Yeah. 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 I'm like, I'll beat you myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I mean that was a sign of, of an attempt to monitor and regulate it may not have been the best, but and she like asks how she's doing when she comes down and wants breakfast and is like, how are you doing this morning, blah, 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 are you sure uh -huh. you're okay? Well, she does ask that, but it's not about what's happening outside. outside the right. Okay. I think she just, I felt like she was asking that because she was like, we're going to send you to <laughs> your cousin's house or whatever. So let's yeah. find some really good examples of where it is regulated beyond just the playing of the children. Would that be like when they're all sitting at the dinner table and Troy goes and closes like the blinds on the kids that are watching them eat mm -hmm. and is like, stay out. Like, mm -hmm. it's like their family time and they, she doesn't want anyone else. Like, mm -hmm. Does, Would you say that this family has a strong sense that they are a family? Uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, well, what I noticed, like what I brought up earlier is like, the son throwing trash, like, he was mm -hmm. wrong, but, like, no matter what, the they family... They all knew he threw the trash over the there. Oh, yeah, the mom even admits it later yeah. on in the movie. Yeah, <laughs> like, they still were, like, had his back no matter what. Like, yep. they, she wasn't going to listen to that guy, you know, say something about her kid. Right. And none of the And that's siblings, a really good example of boundaries. None of the siblings were either. You know, and so this family has a pretty strong boundary. It's not captured in this idea of externally open and regulated. That's just one focus that that Beaver has in his discussion of the model. But you would have to say that it's, that this family has a sense of who they are. That's um, who's in and who's not. And being in means you're supported by everybody. Uh, if you're outside, you're the one at fault kind of approach. So uh, that's a really good example of, of a strong boundary around the family. Uh, they're, all the kids are out there in the, in, in the street playing but you get the sense that they, even when they're out there, there's outsiders and there's them. That there's a connection amongst them. And uh, when he rings, the, blows the horn, they all come charging back. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a sense that they, that they respond to each other in a way that indicates that they, there is a strong boundary around them and they respond to others uh, accordingly. Tony, not Tony, but uh, the singer. Who's the singer? Oh, the guy next door. That's Tony. The no, singer Tony the is that watches their house. Tony is the. I thought Tony was the Tony Four Eyes, isn't it? The the guy next door with yeah, the trash is the dogs. Yeah, I 
dogs. <laughs> uh, anyway, the guy that's on the steps. Maybe that that's watches Tony. their house when they're remember, on yeah. their trip, right? Yeah. And is oh, like, okay. just start singing and is everyone Tony? will is go away. Is Tony too? I think his yeah. name's Tony. So he's on the stoop and he's allowed to be on the stoop, but he's not a family member. Mm -hmm. You get that clear, clear division. And, and the border. There's a sense that there's borders in this house, but they're separate. Uh, although sometimes there's a leakage there because the kids look towards that guy as being hot stuff, right? And, and so they're look, kind of looking up to him like an older brother. And maybe he's playing that role a little bit and they don't have good control over that. And that might not be a good influence for them. Um, it probably undermines the parents' influence on that. Um, Would another one be like when she like dumps the water on the kids and like, get off my stoop. <laughs> like it's like well, their area and she doesn't want to like... Yeah, I mean she's not like doing revenge? it to maintain the boundary, but there's a sense of what's theirs as a family. Mm -hmm. And you can sit on the stoop if you're, if you're accepted. Um, and she was trying to claim for the whole family that he was not accepted, that he was an outsider. Um, so a little bit. Uh, there was also the scene where uh, Woody is banging on the wall to stop the noise from the next door neighbor from playing with his uh, music, yeah. his, whatever right. he called it. Uh, so again, keep the noise out. In this case, it was literally noise, mm -hmm. but that was symbolically, metaphorically, it was, it was boundary noise. Um, what else? How about internal boundaries? We didn't talk, they, he doesn't talk a lot about internal boundaries in his model. Um, Do you see clear internal boundaries in this family that are balanced, somewhat open, somewhat closed? Um, I know there's a very open relationship between Troy and her mother compared to like her mother and the other, I mean that's just what I saw in the other boys because she like, when her mom's feeling sad the next day she's the one that makes her breakfast, she's the one that brings her the stuff from her dad, she writes her mom, her mom writes her while she's away. and. It okay. Just, like her own nickname. There yeah. seems to be a special tie mm -hmm. between the mother and Troy. And when we talk about the system models, before we talk about the specific models, we talk about boundaries and the idea of positional subsystems. Mm -hmm. So there's a gender-based positional subsystem mm -hmm. there to some degree between Troy and her mother. Uh, the parents and the children seem to be separated to a large degree. In fact, the children seem to be on a different floor from the parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like they. It's like, is that Troy's room that they yeah, are? Yeah, what was up with their house? Yeah, it's a little <laughs> unclear. Um, it's because when we first see the opening scene, it looks like they're all together in one big room, doesn't it? And that Troy's just over on the side. Yeah, I think it's like they have a basement, which is like their kitchen. There's a basement living with room. their kitchen living yeah, room. Yeah, and then there's like, sta it's like, it's like a, a townhouse. Yeah, it's a, it's a tenement house. It's got like three stories. But they have each have like their rooms on like the different floors. So I think yeah. they must own the entire thing. Yeah, yeah. Because mm. it was like, and then the other people lived with them too. Yeah, it so it's a side by side duplex. Yeah, it was odd. But it seems like the children are upstairs, yeah, they and the always. parents are on the main floor, and then the living and kitchen area in the basement. Is that kind of the? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. I always saw the kids, and like I thought it was Troy's room, maybe with the TV. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to be Troy's room. Yeah, and, but they're and, always in there. Like, but they're always in there. Yeah. Right. So the siblings have a space for themselves. The parents don't seem to be in the siblings' lives. They, the siblings have a subsystem that's pretty well distinguished. They operate pretty well as a subsystem. They have. Uh, they democratically vote. Oh on, yeah, yeah, on the movie. On the movie, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, they yeah. they develop. They do a lot of things together as siblings. So you probably say, you know, this, and the parents seem to have a separate room. We don't see the parent, the children come into the parents, except in the case where the fight happened, and mm -hmm. then Troy comes across the boundary. And the other little boy was the youngest. Joseph boy was sitting in the bed with the mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, subsystems seem to be there. Uh, with some boundary around them. 
or the parents coming into the children's room, it, that seemed to be a drastic thing when she comes up. Yeah, fight broke out. To, yeah, right? or when the dad comes in and tells And then the fight breaks out. So it's like, no, you have the right. This is your space, almost. And then what about, um, and then the oldest boy? He has a room. He seems to have his own room. Yeah, and there was another one that had his room, the little fat one. He goes in with He has his own room because she comes and wakes him up and like pulls him out and says, you fat little turd or whatever. Well, I thought it was in the same room. Oh, it was a different they, room? It, I think what happened, they have like two of them on a bunk bed uh -huh. and then I think that's a room and then I think there's like another little room over uh -huh. to the side and then Troy's room. there's a door between the bunk beds and then a room right here where the tall kid mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. and then Troy's room. Yeah, okay. It was... It's hard to tell exactly. I know, I was like, what is going on? Yeah. This is a weird house. But you had the sense that you can't go into someone else's room, that there's stuff there and you can leave it there and no one's going to take it, mm -hmm. that it's your defined space. But then Troy actually goes in. Too. She actually goes in, right? And she, like, <laughs> takes the tickets. Yeah. And then <laughs> yeah, I don't get the point. Why did she take the tickets? I think she's going to try and sell them or something. Ooh. Was she? I don't know, because she I took I thought she all just did it to annoy him. Oh, because that's when she took all the, she opened the, his coin book up thing and took all the coins out. And she stuff. took all the coins, and she took the ticket at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, I, okay, I don't yeah. know, but I was just like, she's just taking everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, she violated the boundaries when she went and got the coins. Mm -hmm. And then she just took the extra tickets, too. Right? So I don't think she was going to sell the tickets, but I don't know. I think she'd know how, but. Yeah. I have no idea. But it seemed like she knew what she was doing. Oh, yeah. She opened up the door and she, like, it was almost like she knew where everything was at. So. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, generally, probably more in the adequate range in boundaries. External boundaries, it could use a, a lot better monitoring and regulating. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly open, but not, not open to the point of being unregulated. There's no real sense where they close off completely as a family. Um, except to keep some noise out. Uh, the family's very willing to let outside influences come in for the most part. Uh, and then on the internal boundaries, um, I think we'll hold off on that a little bit because I, I, I mean there are some clear subsystems. There's some crossover now and then, but for the most part the parents have their place. They talk together apart from the children uh, when they're discussing the financial management of the family, so the executive subsystem is the children are intervening in that process. The children seem to have their own place, and both as a subgroup uh, as well as as individuals. Uh, and so I think we'd have to put them in sort of the adequate area on borderline uh, on uh, boundaries. Let's continue with the next dimension is uh, problem solving or conflict management. Uh, if we look at the five types here, um, optimal, irrational, and open, problem solving, effective, uh, with a lot of negotiation, um, direct negotiation. Adequate would be um, problems tend to get solved, but there's lots of glitches in the system and there's not a lot of negotiation uh, um, around uh, with regard to conflict. Uh, Mid-range is unilateral and centralized problem solving. Borderline dictatorial and severely dysfunctional is so that problems don't get solved at all. There's anarchy. So this is pretty close to the control dimension, right? Does this seem to you? Mm -hmm. So what did you find for examples of problem solving and conflict management? How did they do? Um, mom yelled. <laughs> yeah, there was. Mom yelled. <laughs> there wasn't really like, but it was a whole lot of conflict management. Like they had their issues, and they never in the movie they never really got solved. Like the whole issue with the checks. Like obviously they had that issue before, and things were not clicking on either side to mm -hmm. where he got the hint that <laughs> you got to write this down because I can't bounce checkbooks, and she never really got like his need for w his definition of what supportive was. And I don't think there was any negotiation on 
anything really and a lot okay. of their conversations got interrupted i saw on pro like a problem solving level between the kids is <laughs> if any like anything they didn't you know like that was happening, they'd lean over the railing and like yell for mom, mom, dad, doing this. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Good example. And yeah. And then, like, Troy one time was just like, hey, mom's not here. So, like, <laughs> uh huh. So, nothing, like, okay. Yeah. So, you didn't see a lot of negotiation. You saw a little bit with the kids. There was what television show to watch. It was a yeah. And then, when Troy brought home all the candy and whatnot, mm -hmm. she had a bag, like, she wasn't going to share, and then eventually just going to. They stole it from her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they stole it from her. There yeah, wasn't really she's like, well, now I kind of have to share. She wasn't <laughs> so. that big of a fight. I mean, she could have. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of the kids' problem solving was to, like, beat up on each other. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like, it was, like, with the whole thing with Troy, he's like, where are my tickets? And he, like, puts her in a headlock and he's like, I'm going to break your neck. <laughs> right. Don't break her neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think there was, like, a lot of, I mean, that could just be kids, too, because I know that. Like in my family, yeah. I've never, probably never negotiated. I feel like maybe like with just relating to like my family and like this family is like we never really tried to bring our parents into something we knew wasn't like it, the consequences were going to be too high, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. like if it was something that we could either put aside or like fight over ourselves, we'd do it. Unless it was something super big, then we'd like mm -hmm. tattletale or something. Mm -hmm. So right. Um, yeah. So uh, maybe a little negotiation between the children on some things. I mean, yeah, they they just took whatever they wanted, or they liked stealing the candy or the box of cereal, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when it came to watching television, there, w there was some examples of some negotiation going on there. Yeah, I feel like that's because that's something like they did together, whether they like mm -hmm. realized it or not. It was like their time of yeah. I don't want to say peace and quiet, but just like. You know, they were playing all day. That was their time to just kind of chill. I think kind of that supportive sibling subsystem. That was, that was like that inner, yeah, that sibling subsystem. Like, that's what they all did together. Like, yeah. most of the time, it's like either two or three of them always sit around the TV. But when it came to family level things, it was always mom, right? Mm -hmm. She even made, well, I can't remember exact, exactly what she said, but she said, this is my house, and this is this, and it's mine, and it's because I do this, and so, like, right. I feel like she was just, you like... You pay for the electricity bill, you can watch TV. Yeah, so, like, I feel like uh -huh. her problem solving was, well, I do it all, so... That's right. <laughs> it is what it is. She was the problem solver. <laughs> yeah. She did try to uh, engage Woody on the check bouncing talking about possible solutions, mm -hmm. although I'm not sure that she was really going to negotiate at all. I think she probably think wanted to. Her negotiation of that was just like, I'm going to open you your own separate account. <laughs> and right. it was just kind of like, you're going to be on your own. Well, even in, in the car, too, he was like talking about picking up other gigs or whatever, and she was just like, whatever you have to, like, whatever, like, just get something mm -hmm. coming in. So she wasn't. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Okay, good. So we really aren't seeing any real negotiation. Uh -uh. Uh, it's not really anarchy. Problems are being solved. Decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. um, it's not dictatorial. She's not sort of dictating what is going to happen. No, I think she's just trying to like... Outside of just trying to create order. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's just trying to keep it together. <laughs> yeah. But she is the one that's making it, seems to be the one making the decision. So you probably put him in the more of a mid-ranged, mm -hmm. pretty unilateral and centralized problem solving. Yeah. And not very effective conflict management at all. In terms mm -hmm. of conflict management, these, they're... The, the conflict managers who could yell louder. The full of conflict all the time, yeah. Right? Yeah. Next dimension, uh, communication. And so optimal would be direct communication. People talk to each other about things that are important to them uh, openly. A lot of intimacy, an affiliative orientation, liking to be with the other person, a lot of warmth being expressed uh, in day-to-day -day life. Um, adequate would be some intimidation. 
leaks into the system um, and less affiliative, less intimate, um, not as many um, uh, disclosure moments within the family. Mid-range would be a lot of intimidation, low affiliation and intimacy, borderline intimidation, again, low affiliation and intimacy, and dysfunctional severely would be ambiguous without affiliation or intimacy. So where do we put them on communication? How did this family communicate? I felt that they were mid-range because when mm -hmm. the mother asked his children to do things, like she would threaten them. Like, you're going to starve, I'm not going to cook for you, you're going to have to cook for yourself, and instead of just being... Or, yeah, like Go even ahead. in, like when she comes upstairs and that whole fight breaks out, they're watching TV, like she grabs one of her kids. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> She what? I'm sorry. She grabs one of her kids. She grabs she the tall, like, skinny one and like, <laughs> and yeah, like starts like, attacking him. After he like talks back to her, she like, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, and mm -hmm. then, what does she do? Something at the dinner table when she when the guys the little guy's eating his food. I feel like knock the black off. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was in the kitchen. Right? Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. So she, yeah, but I feel like she's that way because she doesn't like she can't. I don't think she has any other way yeah, to she do doesn't, it. Like, you know, asking nicely isn't going to help because she doesn't have anyone to, like, back her up, you know, mm -hmm. so to say. Because, like, Woody doesn't do intimidation. He's, like, more like the emotional support, I feel like, mm -hmm. for the children. Yeah, yeah. He is, uh, going back to role organization, he's, that's another non stereotype role, right? He's the emotional, nurturing mm -hmm. yeah. type, you yeah. know. And she's the control master, which would be a. F just to go back to role organization, a switch and stereotyping, right? Um, okay. Uh, any examples of some affiliative activity or communication and um, sort of talking about things amongst the children or between the parents? Well, I would say like the small window of Troy talking to her mom when mm -hmm. she, whenever that does happen, but. I feel like when she's in the hospital, you know, she has a little bit mm -hmm. of that, like, I mean, she knows her mom's sick, but she doesn't know how sick, and so they kind of have that moment, you know? Yeah. But, um, so. Or, like, when the mom's, like, talking through the letter, it feels mm -hmm. like the, the emotions are sweet and sincere towards her, and that she really mm -hmm. misses her, and that she, that's what I would. Or, like, I don't know if this really counts, but, like, when she calls her a ladybug, Mm -hmm. Like, I feel, you know, like, my mom calls me sis, but she doesn't call my other sisters, like, sis, mm -hmm. you know? So, like, it's, like, something that you share between one person, so, mm -hmm. like... So, there are some moments of, of closeness and intimacy in their interactions. But I don't see it a lot between, like, the males, like... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I see it a lot between Troy and her mom, but not... Oh, at the... Well, I guess at the end when the older brother holds Troy's hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that's kind of... Or when then Troy goes to like and throws up after the thought of her mom dying and her dad kind of like holds her on the... Mm hmm Yeah. I'll say another one. I mean, this was kind of between the parents. It was kind of subtle, but like... When they're like sitting by the candlelight and the dad's like, oh, it's kind of romantic. And the mom's like, are you trying to woo me? And then they like kind of giggle. And, but uh -huh. th I think that was the only time that I ever really saw any yeah. intimacy between the parents. It's interesting because we're seeing this family at a time of enormous stressor. Mm -hmm. um, because of the decision for him to not work anymore. And also because of the stage that the children are in, both Troy and the oldest are in that movement into adolescence. And so that's a really disruptive aspect of their life. Um, and the number of children in the family. And so, you know, you get the sense that this family otherwise would have a different look, don't you? I don't know. It seems like. Like those glimpses of like that scene at the dinner table between Woody and Carolyn kind of suggests that there is a there's a level of love in that relationship and um, at one point in time there was this real connection and then you get these glimpses of the parents with the children and especially Troy somehow Troy winds up being the person but but also Joseph to some degree 
um, that the family had this, if, if things were easier, they would function at another level on communication. But I think for now, you probably, where would you put them? This is a tough one, I think. Yeah. I don't want to say borderline because I feel bad and I like them. <laughs> but, but I'd say like middle to low, uh, mid-range. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I said and I can't remember. What a mid-range? Yeah. Yeah. Just because there was some like intimacy between certain uh -huh. members of yeah. the family. I didn't mm -hmm. want to completely discard that. So. Yeah. And there were instances during the crisis where we see the intimacy happen a lot, right? Yeah, like you see the dad and all the kids crying together and you see that they're connected. And we see the scene in the funeral where the oldest boy goes over and pulls Troy next to him. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the intimidation is an interesting kind of intimidation. It's almost not... It, it's. This is a tough one because it's almost cultural intimidation. It's, it looks like intimidation, but is it really intimidation? Yeah, I. You know what I mean? Does that I make sense? I feel like for like the environment they live in, and like what they're going mm -hmm. through, like that that just might be how she, you know, like how she acts. Yeah. Or how they talk, because yeah. if you listen to the other kids talk yeah. to each other, they're it's very brutal. Yeah, they're brutal, but it's not just like their family that talks that way. It's like everyone on their like block mm -hmm. that talks that way. So yeah, so it could be a misinterpretation as intimidation. Maybe it's yeah. not as intimidating as you think. Yeah, because yeah. they, I mean, like when I think of someone being intimidating, like I think of like almost threatening, like oh, and the I'm other gonna... person is cowered by it. Right? Yeah, yeah, but like yeah. these kids just are like right back, like doing they're the right next, back with it. Mm -hmm. They're doing the yeah. next thing, or they they just still don't listen. So or they take it as. Oh, that's cool. Let's yeah. just go on. You know? yeah, and it might be part of their environment. So later when we talk about the ecological perspective, you know, we have to take into consideration, well, what is the environment that they live in? What are, they, what are the parents preparing the children for? What are, the, what are the kind of skill sets they're going to need to interact in their environment? Well, think about that environment. Look at you know, what they're seeing in the grocery store. You're gonna, what, the, what happens when they come out of the grocery store and she gets beat up by Peanut and you know, and the mother looks like she's unkind. What do you mean you've got beat yeah, up by like a girl named Tina? <laughs> right? But, but is she unkind or is she oh, like not, like trying to, to maybe toughen know. up a little bit? And, mm -hmm. you know, Why'd you let her do that? Come on. Yeah. You know, be, like, be a strong woman. Yeah, because she has to be, like, Carolyn has to be a strong woman. So yeah. She's well, trying she's to teach not, a lesson. Yeah, she's not going to let Troy just, like, <laughs> you right. know, fall over. So in that sense, is it intimidation? You know, when we think of intimidation, we think of someone trying to get what they want by putting down another person. Whereas a lot of the instances that we might call intimidation in this movie aren't that at all. It's, it's more like life, life. life. <laughs> yeah. you know, get used to it, toughen yeah. up, you know, be prepared because mm -hmm. it's a rough world out there. There's a lot of discrimination. You know, you're going to get called all kinds of names. So we'll call each other names in the family, you know. So I, I don't, you know, that's a tough one. I, I, I'd probably put them in adequate to mid-range. There's not a lot of really good signs of affiliative and intimate interactions, but there's some, uh, and they're, they're young. Um, you know, the children, to have intimacy, you have to have a developed self, and there's not a lot that you could say that they have. So, um, on the other hand, Troy's going through some problems and we don't see her ever discussing them. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of open willingness to discuss the issues that they're having. Um, although between Woody and Caroline, they obviously had discussed what he cares about, what he needs in his life, and uh, to, to do his own music and and that must have gotten expressed somewhere down the line. We didn't see it. Yeah, uh, and she must have agreed with him and yeah. cared enough because, or mm -hmm. else they wouldn't be in this situation. That's right. Where. So uh, I, I think I probably put them adequate to mid-range. And then uh, the next one is affiliative responsiveness, which is very closely related. So 
um, optimal high supportive responsiveness. So when people express some need, they get back a, an affirmation of, of who they are and the, the legitimacy of their condition um, and some support in helping them work it through. Uh, adequate would be where you have moderate levels and supportiveness, mid-range, low-level, non-supportive, people don't care, they don't really give you anything back. Um, borderline, no real responsiveness, just uh, I don't really care. And uh, severely dysfunctional is, is also similar to borderline, unbridled autonomy with reflective, uh, without reflective responsiveness. So here we don't see in the severely dysfunctional, this is the autonomous, chaotic, anarchistic system, unbridled autonomy, nobody cares about anybody else. Um, the borderline, um, there really isn't much responsiveness. The focus is on one person getting what they want, the head of the family, uh, people are put down. Mid-range, again, I don't want you to be, I'm not going to be very open to your expressions because I don't, I'm not going to, and I'm not going to respond to them very effectively because the con they're, they're noise, so we need to maintain control. Uh, adequate, yeah, I'm going to do it to a certain degree, um, but it's very difficult because it disrupts the system. Uh, and then optimal is everybody knows about other people's lives and what their issues are and they respond in ways that affirm the individuality of that person and the legitimacy of their needs and their feelings. So where does this one fall and what have we got for some examples of affective responsiveness in the movie? Well, uh -huh. they all, I, I just notice a lot that they all like name call, like they just y mm -hmm. yell at each other, but it's not like, they don't take it the wrong way, you know? Do you uh -huh. know like they don't take it like terribly. It's just almost like a reaction. Like you open your mouth, I'm gonna say something right back to you. So they're not supportive, obviously. I not supportive at all, I don't think, but they're not completely mm. like, oh, I'm only doing this for me, or not. I don't know. Okay. Um, oh, this one, I had trouble with this one. Yeah, uh, I feel like they like are trying to be supportive, but they're all doing it in their own kind of way. So it's not really like looking like it's supportive. Mm-hmm. Like, with the dad and the mom, she's like, oh, I'm doing all this, waking up at the crack of dawn and doing all this. And he's like, oh, you're not supportive, but it's just because she's not flat out saying, do what you want to do, go do your music, blah, blah, blah. Pat, pat on the back. Mm -hmm. um, Although she does say to him, I understand, in that conversation with the checks, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, she does kind of say, she precedes what she's saying with, no, I know what you need, and I, I, I'm okay with that. It's just that you're not understanding what I need. Yeah, or what we need. And, or what we need as a family and how this is impacting us. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of stuck a little bit um, in, in this area. Um, we also have the... Yeah, your comments are good about the notion of the, how they seem to respond in ways that seem negative, but maybe aren't so negative? Yeah, they're, I don't know, like, some of the things they said to each other, I was like, if I was another, like, if they said that to someone outside their family, there'd be a fight, or mm -hmm. there'd be something, like, mm -hmm. going on, but the things they say within each other, it's almost like their own little, like, code, the way they talk to, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want to say mm -hmm. And isn't uh, that kind of, and almost an example of this, of responsiveness is, is, the parents' recognition that Troy needs to go somewhere else. Because mm -hmm. she's Troy boy. Yeah. And that's the last thing she needs is to be Troy boy. Because mm -hmm. she's trying to figure out what Troy is as a woman, not as yeah, she's got some self a boy. She's lost in the maleness of this family. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, their decision to send her to go live with her cousin and aunt is a response 
but it was like the only response that they could give, which says that they're in tune to what she needs. We just didn't see it. Right. right. It's just not being expressed, and we didn't see expressions of that. Um, we do get a little bit of it in the letter she writes to her. So, and then in the funeral, again, we see that responding back, that supportiveness, that, you know, um, Supportiveness when Troy also like when the little, littlest brother comes running in that mm -hmm. one of the other boys like made fun of him and she goes and, like mm -hmm. beats him with a bat. Yeah, yeah, we get a sense that they care about each other, don't we? Yeah, like protect your own. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. like, this yeah. is my herd. Don't touch it. Mm -hmm. So again, I think probably in the adequate to mid range area, probably on on uh, affective responsiveness. And then transcendent values, you know, if I, uh, optimal would be very clear and central values that guided the system. Um, adequate would be, there's a sense, they know who they are as a family, they know how they fit into the broader system of, of things, um, of the universe, uh, but it's usually not very well articulated, no one says what we're about. Um, it's not the guiding path, it's not the reason why they do things. Uh, it doesn't provide a basis for organization, but everyone understands what they're about as a family. Um, Mid-range is a, a weak set of values, borderline um, can be varied. Sometimes they might have strong values, sometimes none at all. And then severely dysfunctional would have none, because there's nothing that ties the family together in that situation. So what are the values that you saw in this family? Did they have transcendent values and what kind of examples would you give for that? Um, when I, I don't know, when I think of like what like their values are, I feel like it's like family itself. Like I always saw them backing each other up, whether it was, mm -hmm. you know, against the four-eyed guy or, you know, at the end when you mentioned um, Troy beating the guy up with the bat. like. They didn't talk about how, oh, we're a close-knit family, but they had dinner together. You know, they, like, hung out together. Like, their family was their unit. So. Okay. Yeah. And it went beyond just their immediate family, didn't it? Yeah. They were very close with, like, their aunt and uncle. Like, they bought them a plane ticket. They went mm -hmm. and lived with them. Like, uh, I don't think my aunt and uncle <laughs> would be like, walk. Yeah. So sort of this sense of uh, roots, yeah. if you will. Um, roots and family and community in the sense of, you know, he's writing a rock opera about his roots. Um, he talks about, he's talking with the brother in the car w about family, and, or, or is it the brother, his brother and his wife talking about family and how it's important. Mm -hmm. um, these connections, you know, I'll pay for your plane ticket, uh, bring your kids here. There's that sense that you're not alone, that you're tied into a network of family. I, I just noticed this because I felt this way before is when the oldest son goes to the Knicks game and he was so excited about it but he missed his dad's like performance oh, yeah. and then when he came back he's like they won but he like knew like he didn't feel as good about it because like he knew he was like oh I miss my dad's like mm -hmm. you know his something that was really important to him their entire family went except for him so mm -hmm. I felt like that kind of took away from his Knicks game <laughs> enjoyment but yeah, kind of connected. but that's a good example for, for another reason in that this family really believes in the individual mm -hmm. and their choices. fulfillment and individual choices and autonomy, you know, like to the very decision that the father can quit his job and work on his music mm -hmm. because this is what he needs for fulfillment. Um, that's sort of affective responsiveness, but it also ties into their value system. Yeah, because Carolyn even gives them the option. She says, she's like, I'm going to give you the option. Mm -hmm. You can go to the game or your... That's right. So. And when he came back, they didn't make him feel bad about it. No, he just, like, it was like him. Like, he just walked out right. the door and was like... Yeah, they even offered him cake. <laughs> yeah. was like, now, his decision to go to the Knicks game ties into another value system that's in this family that I think they tie into pretty strongly. And it, it's, a, it's a cultural element, the value systems, but if you think about 
basketball, and you think about the television show Soul Train. Oh, yeah. And you think about the braids. And when they're... Um, and bangles and things, I'm beads and things. About, to the guy about how they all moved in the like neighborhood, and he's like, before all you people moved in here, uh -huh. I kind of took that as like a culturally black so, reference. So what's the theme in this movie, in this, in this family? I mean, they're really an African-American family. And that's sort of their tie to community, mm -hmm. that, they're, that they're representative of the African-American in America. Not the dysfunctional African-American, but the highly functional middle-class African-American. You know, that they're, they're succeeding as African-Americans and they're proud of that idea. And I think Carolyn really emphasizes that. Um, a lot in what she wears. Um, well, that in her job too, like being a teacher is like a being a teacher. I mean, you don't get paid as great for like you know high school or whatever, mm -hmm. but like it's a high, highly prestigious job when you think about mm -hmm. it. You know, it's yep. something that people respect. So yeah, and the little Puerto Rican girl comes in and says, "You're, you're rich. You're in rich. the car outside." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you're rich, <laughs> but the idea of being rich isn't part of it. It's no, that's not what we're about. We're, we're, part, we're an example of what works. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that they're, they're very, this, they're organized at a transcendent values level around the idea of African American, mm -hmm. functional African Americans. And, and being, one of the reasons for existing is to demonstrate the capacity for an African-American family to, to work and to achieve in society. And I think that's very strong in what they, what they do. And you know, the Knicks game is part of that because for boys watching African-Americans, and basketball is a distinctly African-American sport, you know, successful, um, you know, Walt Frazier, who you probably don't know, was a great Knicks basketball player. Um, and that idea of, of being successful African American is strong. There's some confusions in it, you know, because is basketball really what it's about? I think that the parents would want to say, no, it's not just basketball, it's that's just for a young kid, yes, but you should, in the future, we're going to demonstrate that what's important is art and education. Those are the important things. We see it in them watching Soul Train. You know, what is Soul Train? Is that the respectable African American or is that not so respectable? You know, probably not so respectable, uh, but distinctly African American. And so, how do you transfer that? And the children struggle a lot with that. And then they watch the Partridge family, which is the exact opposite yeah, of African American. Or like the TV show that the girls are watching, one, two, three, yeah, the devil's, devil's after me. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that white culture, being white, and that was why it got so alien. When Troy goes and lives with Aunt yeah. Song, it's like, because no, she went into another universe. Yeah, because, right? like, I felt like <laughs> she secretly wanted to be white. Like, you walked into her daughter's room, there's like, all white Barbies except yeah. for like one Native American yeah. Barbie and then Oh, like, I didn't even know, that didn't even click in my head at all. Like all of them, you know, everything was mm -hmm. just so, who does your hair? Like blah blah blah, you know, like. Yeah. Oh, we have to use a flat iron on this. Yeah. You don't she, I even thought of the dog, her having like a little yeah. dog. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like a Paris Hilton, like little mm -hmm. like. Oh. Koala. Yeah. Like, That's the saddest scene, scene in the movie when the dog pops out. That was head. creepy. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was like. <laughs> Yeah. And then she's like so distraught over that dog that I was like, yeah, a daughter. Good, good. So, but uh, so African American, you know, respectable African American family is a strong, I think, orienting transcendent value system that this family has, and 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 it leads the children to get involved in certain things, and and we see some contrast being presented in the movie to kind of bring that forward, and and so. Um, Aunt Song and Trip to the South and the change in the film format and then them watching the Partridge Family and then watching Soul Train. I was like, 
Mm -hmm. You couldn't like get two Afro more different Sheen things. Commercial. An Afro Sheen and a strong, a strong African American woman. Mm -hmm. Or the you beautiful, know. strong African American yeah. woman. Yeah. Afro yeah. Sheen. I was like, whoa. But what it's saying is that these children are taking on that persona, mm -hmm. and there's something more there than just um, their everyday needs. There's, there's a bigger project that they're about, and that's the transcendent. That's what that's what Beaver means by a transcendent value system. Other areas where we see transcendent values play a role. Would it be kind of like, like the like well, like we were talking about the family and like how they had like their dinner every night and they had like mm -hmm. these certain rituals that they did? Well, that's like part of their culture. All those rituals and it brings the family together and it's a source of cohesion in the family. But beyond that. No. <laughs> I don't know. This, for some reason, I keep thinking about this. Like when, so at the end, when Troy's aunt is it? I think mm -hmm. it's her aunt brings in the nice outfit for yeah. her to wear, and yeah. she's just like, "My mom hates polyester." <laughs> I don't know what that goes into, but because she was, you know, she's like, "Well, no, I think that was part of the African American focus that they have. That yeah. you know, what you wear should reflect who you are and yeah. who we are. We we're, we're African Americans, and we don't do we that." Don't, yeah. Polyester stuff, you know, <laughs> you're like, cause she, cause she always wore cotton tie dyes, right, and batiks, and so. She yeah, something her mom probably, you know, wouldn't yeah. want her to wear. But what about religion? Uh, well, as far as I didn't really see, like, I know they said grace before dinner, but it wasn't really like. Not strong. Mm -mm. Right. Like, thank you for this food. Yeah, the dad was just like, thank you for the food, amen, let's eat. And the mom's like, no, 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 we need to do a little bit more. But then when she went to like her aunt's house, it was all about God. Like it was on the TV. She just said, praise the Lord all the time. And it was, you could tell it had a bigger influence on her aunt's life than it did on her immediate family's life. Yeah, I feel like that's because like part of it too is like they were down south, right? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's kind yeah. of mm -hmm. a big... But well, religion is strong in many African American families, regardless of where they live. But in this one, it, I wouldn't say it's very religious, but they did pray before meals, and they did. Um, and they obviously must have gone to church some, or they were connected to a church because the funeral was in a church. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see a strong religious focus. For like their family, as far as her working all the time and stuff, I probably took the back burner, but wasn't. Yeah. The other, the other one I would say, community. Care of the community. Mm -hmm. Keeping up your neighborhood. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, I can see that. That this was their community. Yeah, wasn't there And signs? their purpose was to keep it together. There, I thought there was like a bunch of signs. Well, there I were know. signs about keeping your community clean. And she planted the trees. Mm -hmm. That she came home and was like, during that these? summer. Or your mom did it. She planted the trees or something. Yeah. And uh, Tony and the... The guy next door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Miss Stinky. Miss, Miss, yeah, Mr. <laughs> Stinky. Stinky. Yeah. So that idea of keeping the community together and keeping it safe and creating something in the community, I think, was part of who they were as a family as well. So.